John, it's thrilling to have you here. I've for many years known, or I've known you for a long time, and I've always felt that you really have been a, a wonderful CEO, set a great example, you're humble, you lead by example. Um, we want to get into some of that later on today, but to start out, why don't you tell us a little bit about your background, where you're from, um, how the baseball team is from that town, and other things, and, and how you worked your way to DC, and uh, we'll go from there. Sure. Can you hear me? Terrific. Uh, first of all, thank you for having me here. This is really an honor. You know, it's a wonderful audience, and I'm just honored to be up here. Um, uh, quick background. So I'm a Cardinals fan, so that tells you where I'm from. Um, and I'll now talk about that for the next 45 minutes before your other speakers. Uh, no. Uh, so from the Midwest, was an accountant out of college. Went to work at Coopers and Librand, so I'll date myself back when there was a big eight. Uh, and then from there went on to what is today AT&T. Was, um, did mergers and acquisitions work initially, and then I, we bought Metromedia Paging and Metromedia Cellular. Some of you may remember those companies. Um, I thought I was in the paging business. Uh, I found out this morning from Mr. Collins, from Bill Collins, and he told me, no, John, we were in the mobile wireless business. So we don't date ourselves that way, so people can think it's more modern, but actually it was the paging business, which was you know, a great learning for me, you know, because one of the things I learned in that business, it was a very much a cutthroat price competitive commodity business and I learned very quickly that I never wanted to be in one of those again and I am gonna move away from that which is what led me to the software business because I said you know I want to be in something where there are strong intellectual property you can have large gross margins and you don't have to worry about if people are using paper cups instead of you know some other kind of mug in your office because you know that's why you're gonna save money um, and so that got me into the software world and Southwestern Bell had Today, TNT had moved me out to New Jersey, and I got recruited down to this area to run a company called iDirect, which we ultimately sold to Singapore Technologies, which was in satellite communications. We made routers, and then VCMO, which was in big data, enterprise search initially. We repositioned it there, and now Decision Lens. Great. Well, thanks for that. So um, you've got a varied background. You've worked for companies in different industries, um, iDirect, the VCMO, and now Decision Lens. Can you talk a little bit about how you learned these industries and, and uh, the competitive landscape and how you've been able to execute so well? Because you're not a sort of one silo guy. You've done a variety of different things. Yeah, no, yeah, that's right. And maybe I'm still trying to figure out what I might ultimately be good at so I can find an industry I can be successful in. I don't know. But uh, no, when I look for an opportunity, Tian, so there's being an accountant, I guess, I look for models. I like some form of structure. And so I kind of think of the business at three levels when I look for an opportunity that I might be able to add some value to. And across the top is what I talked about earlier. I want it, first of all, to be business to business because business to business products are primarily sold based on economics as opposed to business to consumer, which can be other reasons why consumers buy. Uh, and I think as a financial person, I understand those economics. I can understand the value proposition. It's easier for me. Um, and I want it to have strong intellectual property and very high gross margins. And so I look for that because then I think you have the resources to build the business. At the second level, I want to make sure there's strong subject matter expertise within the business because I'm not going to bring that, right? And that they're doing something different, right? We all probably read the book Blue Ocean Strategy, but that they are going after a new market, not trying to do something that four or five others have done. And I'm not saying that's a bad thing to do, which is for me, I find that more interesting. Uh, and then at the third level, somewhere where I can add value. Is the company stuck in such a way? They're obviously asking me to come on. There must be a reason why they want me to join. You know, what is that blocker? And is it something I think I can add value to? Is it execution? Is it building the sales organization? Is it focusing the business? And I look for those elements. And as long as that's there, there's a real advantage in coming in as the CEO in that you get the permission to ask stupid questions. Right? So I can ask a lot of what I would consider to be probably basic questions about the value proposition and get the team to explain to me why someone should actually buy their product. And again, it's a business to business product. I'm a financial person at heart. Explain the economics of this to me. Why will it change outcomes for me if I'm your customers? Right? And so I don't feel I need the subject matter expertise, but I do a lot of homework up front to find out, do I have a lot of people in the organization who are already experts in that business so that I don't have to bring that? And I'll bring the other business discipline, leadership, hopefully financial sense, et cetera, to the business. Right, so go, let's go back to iDirect. So what were they seeing in you? What was their you know, sort of business need when they recruited a new CEO? And how did you change it? And if you could walk us through sort of the growth um, trajectory that you had up to the exit to Singapore. Great. So 
When I came into IDirect, what they were seeing and what I was told they were seeing was nothing at all like when I got there. And it wasn't their fault. I was recruited by an investor who I'd worked far before, uh, who had invested in iDirect. And he said they had $150 million in customer contracts that they were now going to need to fulfill. They, were in, they made satellite routers and were also in satellite communications. So they leased transponder time on satellites. And we're going to provide broadband communications across satellite. And they said, we've raised $53 million. We've spent most of it on development of this, but we can raise more. We've got $150 million in customer contracts, strong balance sheet, good team, What year et was that around? That was 2001. That was the end of 2001, just post 9-11. And um, I did my diligence. I looked at the customer contracts. I looked at the financial statements. I looked at press releases about these big contracts, et cetera. Uh, and then I got there, and day one, I found out that the two customers who signed these contracts were essentially not real, and they were never going to be able to fulfill on these agreements. Uh, the company was over $30 million in debt. It had almost no cash on its balance sheet. It had no receivables, and it had no revenue. And why, end, why did you take the job? Uh, well, I'd already taken the job. This is the end of day one. I, I looked at customer contracts, financial statements. Who was statements, the search firm involved? All the other, it, it was a, no, it was a friend of mine who was an investor. And so he recruited me over to do it. He's a marvelous salesperson. He'd sold me on all these wonderful Obviously. benefits. And um, we literally get to the end of the day one, and I told him, I said, look, I just, you know, I want to walk through some things with you, but do you realize the company is technically bankrupt? I mean, you have over $30 million in liabilities, primarily from termination penalties on these satellite contracts, very little money in the bank, et cetera. And he looked at me and he said, John, I thought you were a smart guy. And I said, well, given the fact that I'm sitting in this chair, I no longer believe that either, but <laughs> we should take a walk and I'm going to show you something. And I walked him down to the gentleman's office who was the CFO and I said, remember he told you that he cut all those checks to pay all those bills? I said, he did not lie to you. And I took him in his office and I showed him, I said, and they're all sitting on his bookshelves. He didn't mail them. He didn't pay the bills. He wasn't trying to be dishonest, but you know, the company's in terrible financial conditions. I said, okay, here's the thing though. I've had, this is very late in the evening. I said, I've had a long time to think about this today. And I still come to the same conclusions I did before I got here. You have a great market opportunity and you have a great product. And those things I was able to validate in diligence and I still felt very strongly about them. I said, we have a balance sheet problem. And balance sheet problems are finite and can be fixed. Okay, it is gonna take a lot of work to do it, but I think we can get there. And many lessons learned for me in that, and I'll tell you, one of the most powerful was the importance of transparency and honesty. You know, because within the first couple of weeks, I'm having my first all employee meeting, and clearly I've gotta do a big downsizing. We've gotta, you know, right size our structure. I gotta somehow figure out how to get some money in there. But there was a strong argument not to share with the employees all of the problems from some people, and I said, absolutely not. And I stood up and I told them, I said, look, here's the reality. We have enough money for three more payrolls. I'm not even completely convinced I should use it on three more payrolls. I've got to sort through some of the liabilities. I said, guys, we don't have customers. I don't have answers. I'm not going to tell you I come up here with some magic fairy dust to get this done. But, but I do still believe in our product and our market opportunity. We need to get some deals done. But we need time. And the gentleman who was the controller, the CFO is obviously not here any longer after those first couple weeks. He came up to me and he said, look, thanks, and I see it, he said, you know, we have a tenant in this building that subleases from us who has a very large deposit, security deposit, and wants to get out of their space and downsize, we could probably get their security deposit. And it bought us like four or five payrolls by getting, he got the deal done within a couple days. It bought us four or five payrolls, and in that time, I was able to deal with the two satellite carriers that we owed all the money to, and again, went into them very honestly, told them, here's the truth, I didn't put you in these positions. I gave them a path out to never get their termination liabilities, but they had about $6 million in short-term liabilities that I said we can fund over a longer period of time. Was honest with them, and they played ball, so to speak, and we got a very large customer to then sign up with us. And I had to take my investors there to tell them that they would fund the company if they would sign up and the creditors would do it. And that first year we did five million in revenue, the second year 20, the third year 50. I mean, it was just off to the races because we had a good product and we had a good market opportunity, you know? And I said, don't be afraid of these liabilities. They're finite, the market opportunity is not. And so we just, let's just be very disciplined about this. And so I learned a lot in that, Tian, but you know, in that, you know, and, and maybe I learned to do better diligence. I thought I did very good diligence, um, but the board knew nothing about all these things. Most of the employees didn't know about all of these things, you know, so they were clearly being hidden. But 
we solved the problems, but it was, you know, I think it was more honesty and openness and, you know, building the right culture, you know, to get focused on the right things that got us back. And, you know, if you've got a great market opportunity and a great product, you can build a great business. No, we'll talk about culture in a little while, but what about the exit? You know, at what point did you start looking around and how did you go about the process and how did you find Singapore and why Singapore? Yeah, good question. So, you know, I'm a big believer, as I'm sure many of us are, right? The businesses, it's better to be bought than sold. You know, it's better to have somebody come knock on your door than, you know, go out there and look for something. And another company, one of our big competitors, actually knocked on our door and made us an offer. And it was a very fair offer and the board was considering it, but we wanted to go out and find out if there were any alternatives. And so we hired a banker and we didn't do a big process because we didn't want to lose our bird in the hand, if you will. Uh, but this banker happened to know the people at Singapore Technologies and went over and talked to them. Uh, and they made us a better offer. And so we did that. And, you know, my preference actually was not to sell the, com the company at the time. You know, as I said, we went from 5 to 20 to 50 to 86. I can still remember these numbers very well. We were headed for 121 that year. The company ultimately under Singapore Technologies grew to 250 or 260. It's still doing great. I wanted to build a bigger company. I would have been happy to maybe take it public. We were looking at taking it public, you know, and go from there. But my board members who had been through this period in the late, to 19, late 1990s, right, where they put $53 million in, thought they had this incredible big opportunity. And then reality set in and they realized the company was bankrupt and that, you know, we did not go through bankruptcy. We negotiated these things outside the courts, but they realized they'd lost it all. And now they'd made all their money back and then some you know, they were like, okay, we've already been through this. We'll take this bird in the hand. I know you'd like to go public, but we don't want to do that. We'll be happy to take our money. Um, so they wanted to exit in Singapore Technologies, and they were a phenomenal acquirer. Difficult deal. They're very disciplined. They do a really good job on diligence, but they were great to work with. I stayed for the company a couple of years afterwards, and they were just really terrific people to be partnered with. That's terrific. Any key learnings or anything you want to share about that whole process in dealing with that you, buyer? you know, and, and I would say this is the same as IBM who bought Vivissimo, right? If I gave anybody advice on acquisitions, it's number one, be prepared now. Don't wait until somebody knocks on the door to get everything in order. And I don't just mean your financial statements audited. Um, everybody who's ever worked on your technology, make sure you've got a release from them. So you know you own that technology, right? Every customer you've ever sold anything to, make sure that your sales tax are in order et cetera, right? Because once you get in the process of an acquisition, it's overwhelming and time is your worst enemy. And so you want time on your side and if you're completely buttoned up, you'll get time on your side and you'll be able to put pressure on the buyer instead of them putting pressure on you. And so the two things I'd say is one, and I know that you think, okay, it's well off into the future. That's a lot of work. It can be a lot of work. Get a really good due diligence checklist, go through there and make sure that you can answer everything. Whether you're going public, you're raising capital, or you're being bought. You need it for all of those, right? So be very buttoned up. And then second, you got to have leverage in those negotiations. And if it's a strategic buyer, in the case of Singapore Technologies and IBM, one of the best pieces of leverage is a management team that absolutely believes in what you're doing and has no interest in being acquired and would much rather build the company and go public and make sure that somehow that buyer knows that they're competing against you, right? And that you're not weak in this process. Yeah. Well, that's great, very sound advice. So Vivissimo, so you didn't rest very long because the next thing I knew you were up in Pennsylvania working for this you know, business intelligence company, uh, Vivissimo. Can you talk a little bit about your experience there? What were they looking for? What stage were they at? And Yeah, you know. so Vivissimo was initially an enterprise search company. It was a spin out of Carnegie Mellon University, three, two professors and one grad student from Carnegie, Carnegie Mellon University who'd come up with a different way to approach search, uh, the indexing of search, uh, to make, <coughs> excuse me, that search much faster and much more scalable. What, what year was this around? They, le they left the university, I think, in 2000, 99 or 2000. You joined them? And I joined them in 2009. Got it. Yeah, I had been on their board of advisors, so it's like their board of directors, but it wasn't actually a director position, it was their board of advisors, uh, for probably a year and a half or two years before that just through some network connections, right? They'd asked me to do that. I had some other connections to Pittsburgh, so they thought that would make sense. And, you know, I'd been helping them. They went out and did a CEO search. Uh, they did not find what they wanted. Um, we went through a process and they asked me to take the position. And uh, I was really interested in the company because one, it was in the search area and the whole big data area, I found pretty interesting. It isn't something I'd worked in before, 
But I said, you know, there is this fundamental problem that we are amassing incredible amounts of data and being able to use that data to affect actionable outcomes in business can make significant economic value for end customers, right? But we've got to tame the data first. And so all these technologies, Hadoop, which many people have probably heard of, all the enterprise search technologies are coming along. And I said, okay, great. So now we have the tools we need to tame it. What outcome do we want to affect? And there's many, many, many outcomes, right? So let's find one that's inter interesting to me that's a very scalable problem, right? A problem that many people has. And so that's, we took Favissimo and we turned it to what we called customer experience optimization. So high-end customer service people. I'll give you an example. Um, uh, Airbus has 5,000 engineers who serve all of their airline clients. And those engineers work with multiple enterprise applications inside their system. And when someone from Delta Airlines calls, they've got to help them as quickly as possible get that plane back in the air. Well, they've got to go through many different systems to find that data. And so we took our enterprise search technology, our big data technology, connected it to all those internal systems and optimized it so that they could answer those calls faster. And they would tell you that the call time went from 50 down to 15 minutes on average, which saved them significant amount of money, right? And we applied that in many other similar cases. Where Is the company a service company to begin with, or did you actually productize this? This was, we, we productized that. It was very much a product company even when we got there, but it was across any use case. So anyone who had an, a search problem within their company, not a public search company, right? Public search business, but within their company, where you needed to connect to a number of different data repositories so that people could get access to those easier. They sold the software to do it with a little bit of services to go along with it. Um, but Vivisimo also, and this is one of the things I think I was able to help them with, was not only going after every use case you could imagine inside the enterprise, but they were also in the public search business. So they were trying to compete with Google right at the time. They were in the hosting business where they were hosting applications for people. And one of the things that our team did was convince the founders, let's get focused. We're not going to beat Google. There was a strong push that, no, wait a minute, maybe we can. And I said, guys, this is 2009. You know, <laughs> Google won, okay? <laughs> There's no way we're going to do this. But, you know, they'd look at it in their heart of hearts because they started the business about the same time Google did. It was really hard to give up that we missed you know, I said, well, you didn't, you didn't miss, you maybe missed that opportunity, but there's many other opportunities for this technology. Let's go leverage them. And what they really did well was handle unstructured documents. So not in databases where you have rows and columns, but in Word documents, in PowerPoint presentations, and anything else you can think that isn't, you know, naturally in rows and columns. Their indexing technology was incredibly scalable, which is why, at the end of the day, IBM bought them. It's now a core part of Watson, and it handles the unstructured data piece for Watson, if you with the IBM Watson project. I didn't want to go back to your prior point about, you know, the, the founders wanted to take on Google, right? So a lot of the entrepreneurs in the room have great technology, great products that can be served into different markets, right? So, and of course, as an investor or as a CEO, you want to focus, which is what you did. How did you determine which one of these things on your menu you were going to kill or sell and which one, which one thing you were going to, you know, really that all the chips on. Yeah, so How did you go through that process? Yeah, it's a good question. So in, in the book, Crossing the Chasm, one of the points that he makes in the book is, don't try to take a fortified hill. <laughs> and so when you looked across at Google, you said, you know, that hill's beyond fortified, right? And a little company like ours is not gonna take that on. So it was, it was not easy to kill that though. It was easy for me, it was not easy for them. And it's luck matters a lot in business. I'm literally in my office in Pittsburgh. I had an office in Pittsburgh as well as here one day. And one of our admin people comes over to me and says, there's somebody on the phone and they would like to buy Clusty was the name of this product. And I'm thinking there is no price that isn't good enough because I want to shut this down. It's losing money every month. And I get on the phone and this guy tells me, all right, he goes through and he goes, look, I'll, I'll give you $5 million for it. And I'm thinking I'm being punked. This is somebody who knows me. <laughs> this is not a real conversation. <laughs> and then he proceeds to tell me that he's got to give me a lot of it in his own stock. But I'm thinking any amount of cash. And at the end of the day, he gave us about $800,000 in cash and $4 million of a stock and a penny stock public company. Fine. I was able to take that to the board and then they couldn't say no. Before this, they were looking for a home for this. Fortunately, I got out of it. But it was easy to say, that's a fortified hill. I'm not going after Google. I'm not going after the hosting market. There's a lot of big hosting companies out there. What do we do extremely well? That's the question I really try to ask is, what do we do really well? What we do really well is we handled unstructured documents really fast, and we have a great user interface that they had invested a lot in 
to make it very easy to implement in an enterprise. So we could go into an enterprise and in a matter of weeks, we could connect to seven or eight repositories and give you a very custom looking user interface for your business to help different classes of employees, but we wanted to focus on this one employee, which was people who served large enterprises. So high-end customer service people, account managers, right, who maybe, you know, I'm the Cisco guy and I'm working, my at and is my account, and I got to worry about our trouble ticketing system and our ERP and all these other, SharePoint, all these other applications. And as a sales guy, I'm never going to learn all those applications. Fine, we'll make it easy for you. And then we kind of turned the search paradigm around and said, rather than that person searching for things, let the system search for them. They learn, teach it to learn about you so that when you log in every day, it knows these are your accounts and here's the types of things you usually want to know and present that. And we could get about 80% right and about 20% of the others you would have to go search for yourself. You know, because you may want to know something about the account otherwise. We said, this is what we do great. Our customers essentially taught us that. That's what we'll focus on. Wow, that's great. And then at what point did you decide that you were going to exit? Well, you know, <laughs> The day that somebody from IBM emailed me and said, I'm with the uh, mergers and acquisitions group and I'd really like to talk to you. And uh, so I, it, was, it wasn't an auction. You basically got us no. unsolicited. Yeah, we were actually yeah. out looking for capital. We were going to raise money. We were talking with some growth equity people. So I had hired a banker who was actually helping us do that. But I will never forget because it was September 28th and our year end was September 30th. And I got the email and I, told, I emailed the gentleman back. I waited a few hours because I didn't want to appear interested. And, uh, <laughs> I emailed him back and said, look, I'll be perfectly honest, it is our year end, I'm extremely busy, how's sometime next week or the week after? And he said, oh, that's perfectly fine, how's tomorrow morning at 9.15? And I said, well, I get it, you're the big dog. And um, so I said, fine, I'll make 15 minutes available. And he said, my boss is going to be in town on Monday night, he wants to have dinner with you. And then, that was September, it, they acquired us in May, so it was still a pretty long ride. Right, but and, and they how did have, they find you, and what was it that got them so excited about you guys? Well, it, you know, it's a good question, Dan, and they'll never admit the truth, I don't think, because um, the person from IBM who really championed the deal told our bankers, our bankers, like, you know, didn't you find out about them through us, right? They want to get the credit from. We had a wonderful, and the guy says, no, no, I'm old friends with John Keeley, and I'm like, well, my memory's not that great, but I don't remember him at all. <laughs> I'm searching my LinkedIn, I'm going through all my contacts. I'm like, okay. Um, but he just said, no, I know John. I think there's two ways in which they could have found us. One is Forrester had done a report on enterprise search technologies. And they had a solution. They had something called OmniFind, which was an enterprise search technology. And they rated us number one of all the other enterprise search technologies, especially when it came to unstructured data. And they were looking for something. They had a hole in their roadmap in building Watson, and it was in this unstructured area. And I think they were doing research on it. We had also unseated them at a couple of very large accounts where they were trying to implement their solution. It wasn't quite, because theirs was a little more uh, raw, I guess is a good way to put it, you know, and, and ours was more productized, and ours was very easy to implement. And I think sometimes that gets people's attention too. But I think the Forrester report was probably the key. You know, and then I can tell you a funny little story which also helped validate it was um, we were meeting with all of their product people as part of the acquisition and the head of product, their product management, who has a hundred product managers who works for her, so she's a very senior person, is in there and we're talking about Gartner. And Gartner was a client of ours. Not only were we a client of theirs, they were a client of ours. If you go onto the Gartner site and you did search for documents and we had replaced Google, who had an enterprise solution, but you know, Google's primarily for consumer, right? That's their strength. They're amazing company, but we had replaced them. And we mentioned that, and she goes, that's yours. It's so much better. I love that so much that works so well. And I'm sitting there thinking, okay, that gives me leverage in this deal. <laughs> if I have her on my side, because she owns this roadmap, right? But that also helped us. The fact that she could help validate, because she was a user now. She realized she was a user of our technology, and it was making a difference for her. So I think all those things, and I think at the end of the day, they're never gonna, they would never really come completely clean with how did you find us? Because I was curious myself. Interesting, because he wanted to meet with you the next day. So he, that did. Was, he did. He yeah. did. So I, why it became so urgent, I don't know. Now, I will also say, you're probably familiar with Autonomy, who was bought by oh, yeah. HP, with possibly Indeca that was bought by uh, Oro. Those two had been bought out within about the year before that. And so I think the list of enterprise search companies was getting shorter, which helped us also. You know? right. And so. How did the negotiations go? Any kind of funny stories or learnings from that? <sighs> you know, I, are there funny stories or learnings? No, I think that, you know, like I said, you, the one funny story probably is, like I said, in diligence, you want to be buttoned up. 
and they will bring in, they are incredibly disciplined, and they will bring in a lot more people than you could ever put in front of them, right? Like I told my team, I said, you know, if this were basketball, we're not playing, we're not going one-on-one -on -one here. We don't have a one-on-one -on -one defense. We're, you know, dropping back in a zone, okay? And you got to take those five, and you take those five. Uh, because they landed in with like 40 people into a hotel to ask questions, and then 25 or so others on the phone. But the funny thing was they gave us this incredible diligence checklist that they wanted done before they would schedule their people to come in. And my counterpart said, okay, here's when, if you can get it done by this date, here's when we'll be in there. And I said, you're on, we'll get it done. And the one thing was, I sat with my team and I said, look, we have to have these things done by Tuesday, close of business. And they were like, there's just no chance in the world we're gonna do that, it's just not, it's not going to happen. And I said, no, it, it is gonna happen. We are gonna get this done by Tuesday at close of business because they are committed on the other end than to have these people in here a week later if we do that and time is against us. Time's your enemy in a deal, right? And um, the one funny thing was my CTO said to me later, he said, you know, John, the thing that amazed me was when you told us we were gonna have it done by Tuesday, you did it with a straight face. <laughs> and then we did have it done and I called the guy and he said, look, I can't have my team there. I didn't expect you to be done. And I said, no, I said, look, your relationship with my team is important because you want these guys going forward and you need to show them that you're gonna be committed that you keep your commitments and you have a commitment to them and you're going to be here next week you and your team are right and he said let me see what i can do and i said no no look you need to tell me right now on this call you're going to be there because i feared that i've been told by people look you're the new nice shiny object if they get focused on something else you could easily lose this deal and i understand that happens a lot with these big companies right and i said guys we've got to move fast and he kept his commitment then and he got the people in there and he, and at the end of the day there were people in, who've now gone over to the organization who said, you know, it's a good thing we got it done fast because there were some other things that came in behind it that really started to get their attention and they might have gotten focus off of us as we wouldn't get it done. So, you know, it goes back to be ready. If we weren't ready, that's why we could get it done by Tuesday because we really were ready. It was now just a matter of gathering all the documents, not so much preparing them, um, but you've got to be ready for it when they come in. So. Wow. Great story. So tell us a little bit about Decision Lens and, um you know, why did they bring you in? And I know you've done a couple rounds of capital. And what are your plans for the company? Great. So Decision Lens is portfolio prioritization and optimization software. Have any of you guys ever seen the movie Moneyball? You've seen the movie Moneyball. The Oakland A's, they take experts and data, and they put it into models, and they make choices. Because that's portfolio selection, right? There's thousands of baseball players out there. I can put, only put so many on a roster. They actually use Decision Lens software to do this, as do a number of other sports teams. Sports is a horrible business. I know I love sports, but when you try to do business with, you know, NFL teams, the Cowboys use it, the Chiefs use it. Are the it. Cardinals using it for free? The Cardinals. <laughs> I'd be happy to do that. In fact, the Nats asked if they could give us uh, concessions and tickets, which I respect. And I said, when my landlord starts taking hot dogs for rent, I'm in. <laughs> okay. The Cardinals I might do that deal with, though. <laughs> um, but our primary use cases are IT prioritization. So if you're a CIO and you have a very large needs, right? You have $2 billion worth of things people would like you to do and you can only spend a billion dollars. How do you do scenario and trade-off analysis? And our analytics tools allow you to do that. Is it only for huge companies? Well, you know what? It's only for huge problems is probably the best way to think of it, Ian, because as I tell people, if you've got 25 alternatives that you're considering, and then you can probably do this in an Excel spreadsheet. But if you've got I have clients with 8,000 alternatives that they're trying to work through. And if you have that many, there's no way you can visualize that in an Excel spreadsheet. And so you've got to use more complex algorithms and more sophisticated analytics to really work through what is the optimal portfolio in the scenario analysis. And so you don't have to have 8,000 for this to make sense, but just think about if I had a spreadsheet and had more than this many items on it, when would it no longer really be workable? So it tends to be, we tend to focus on big companies. They also tend to have more money. So, you know, if you have a billion dollar budget, you know, paying hundreds of thousands of dollars a year for this is doable. If you have a $10 million budget, it's not, right? And um, so, so we tend to focus on IT prioritization. The company's history is the two founders' father invented a science called analytic hierarchy process. He's done some fascinating things with it. It's a mathematical model to be able to bring data and experts into these models to be able to do scenario analysis and they wanted to commercialize it. I'm friends with one of the two founders. He actually worked with me at iDirect 11 or 12 years ago and they got it to a certain point where they were primarily a consulting business with a tool 
and they did lots of different portfolios, which is why we do sports teams, and we do lots of interesting things in the government, and we probably have 20 departments of transportation, so we use it for capital planning, and et cetera, and said, you know, what we really want to do, though, is we want to scale the business. And so they asked me to come in and help them, and I told them, you know, first thing is focus. We've got to be willing to say no, which is a tough thing when you're opportunistic, right, to a lot of opportunities, but we've got to find the one where we can add the most value, um, and to be honest, right now with Decision Lens, we are crossing the chasm. It is probably one of the hardest things I've ever done professionally because crossing the chasm is hard, right? There are visionary buyers who see what we do and they see the value, but we haven't gotten over to pragmatic buyers yet. So we're growing slower than I would like, but crossing over is hard. There's no natural competitor for this. People do this today with a spreadsheet and some smart people. And convincing them now that we have a much better solution not a simple thing to do. But we're getting there. We're making progress. And I think being great at one use case is helping us. Right. And so this is true blue ocean it you're is. going into. It is. So what are some of the things you're considering or what are, your, what are your sales and marketing people looking at in order to make, you know, make, make the case against the Excel spreadsheet? Yeah, so you know, one of the things is to be disciplined. In, it's almost lean in, but you can't lean in too hard. So an example, uh, about a year ago, we, or about a year and a half ago, one of the use cases that the company had success with was R&D portfolios. So large companies, they have lots of money they want to spend on R&D and they have to make some choices. And we leaned in with our sales team to go after, and our marketing organization to do a lot of conferences and have a lot of people out there selling R&D portfolio managers. And we found very quickly that there's something R&D portfolio managers do not have, and that is a resource constraint. That in the big companies, most of them end up funding everything they want to fund and the CEOs will cut everything else before they'll cut R&D because they fear missing an opportunity. And the people that we signed on as clients are true visionaries and early adopters and I've gone out and talked with all of them. And when I talk with them about, you know, why do you use the software? It is because I believe in the future I'm going to have issues where I will be resource constrained and I want to be prepared for that as opposed to I have it today. But it's amazing the number of them I talk to and they'll say, I don't, can't name the companies, but I was talking to one recently and he said, you know, when we get right up to the time when we're going to fund all of our projects, inevitably somebody comes in, a number of people come in with five or six or seven projects more, and it'd be nice to use your software to prioritize those. I said, what do you do now? So we just fund them all. Because I can't miss them. I can't be wrong and have those left behind. And so I said, okay, you got to find a market with pain. And so we have to be disciplined, you know, and it's, we're in the figuring it out stage, not the rolling it out stage. And so we have raised a little bit of capital. We raised $4.4 million in equity from angels. We will not do another round for some time because I want to go slow enough that we don't waste money. And that's something, honestly, I'm not used to doing, going slow enough, you know, because I was in markets where it was an established market and we had a great product, roll and it now out. Now you're and creating run. the market. Now we're creating the market and you've got to be patient in that. Gartner's starting to follow this space and they're writing about it, which is excellent. Forrester is. Met with the Gartner analyst a month ago and we were talking about it and he's now started talking about us to his customers, which is wonderful. And he said to me, he goes, John, just stay alive for a couple of years. Be patient. The market's coming to you. And I said, Daniel, the market can be patient longer than we can be solvent. Okay? <laughs> I can't just focus on this. So we do a lot of other what I'll call project work. We do a lot of work for the government. We do a lot of work for state governments and departments of transportation still. We do a lot of other use cases other than IT prioritization. But I do believe that is ultimately our future because I think the right amount of pain, we have the right amount of value. It's a very big market. We've got really good early adopter customers who are becoming zealots for us and helping us talk to other CIOs. And I think it's there. It's just when the, it's, it's hard to gauge market timing. It's something I have not had a challenge of doing before, and it's a difficult thing to do. How about the com competitive landscape? Anybody looking at it right now? If Gardner's covering it, then... Great point. Th so if you're familiar with the project portfolio management, PPM solutions, CA has, they bought a company called Clarity. If you know Microsoft Project is a PPM solution. It's this project management solution. Most of the big guys, Clarity, Plainview, Planisware, they're all big in that space. They start talking about this. And if you go to their website, they will talk about doing project prioritization. But if you look at what they're really doing, it's not what we do, and for a very simple reason. Our DNA is in decision science and strategy. Their DNA is in execution. And it's a very different challenge, and so they don't really do what we do. I like when someone says to us, I've got clarity, I'll pick on clarity, wonderful product for PPM, and it really is. But I've got clarity, I can do that. I, I love when they say, excellent. Let's compare ours to theirs. And so we landed a very large, multi, multi, multi billion dollar company, one you guys all know and have actually used their product at some point in time, I'm sure, uh, if you ever fly. 
Um, and they said, we have clarity. And so we said, great, let's get the clarity team and let's present it. It's their internal team. 10 minutes into the presentation, the guy said, just stop. We don't need the hour. We're done. You do it. We don't do it. You know, because our DNA is in decision science and how you build these algorithms to actually do scenario analysis and come up with intelligent portfolios is not as simple as just ranking projects one to N. It's not. And, and so we do it much differently. So they're all talking about it, which I think is great. You know, Gartner's talking about how we are the next extension of PPM. So Daniel Stang has this pyramid that he draws and it has four layers. And the first three layers are PPM systems, more sophisticated as you move up. And I'm at the Gartner conference, the big conference they do in October, just earlier, a couple months ago. And Daniel's talking about this in front of a group this large. And he says, he talks about these three layers and he just talks generically about, yeah, there's companies in each space. He goes, then you get up to this pyramid at the top, which is strategic portfolio prioritization. There's only one company that really does that, that's Decision Lens. You should go see them. I almost ran up and hugged him, but I thought the guards will probably tackle me if I run up to the front of the room, you know? But it's still, we're early, you know? And so that's, so we have to, I'm used to wanting to lean in really hard, raise capital, really invest in sales and marketing. That's the one thing I'm still trying to gauge is being patient. I'm not a patient person. You probably tell at the pace I'm talking, right? I'm exactly a patient guy. So that's what's challenging. Very interesting. Uh, so I know we have, a similar product that we're sort of trying to figure out as well. So your thoughts have been um, valuable to us, I think. We can circle back later. Um, we're going to open it up to questions in about two minutes, but I do have a question for you before we do that sure. regarding culture. And, you know, you're into behavioral science, decision science. You don't view culture as a soft thing. Not you view all. it as a, uh, you know, something that's built around rigor and... It's a science, basically. It right? is a hard Talk science. about how you sort of got into that view and some of the learnings from people and books that you've been uh, right. studying over the years. Sure, sure. So when I gave you my career history, I left out a few year uh, time frame when a good friend of mine was a partner in this firm called the Continuous Learning Group. And what they are is 100 PhDs in applied behavioral science who primarily coach Fortune 50 CEOs and their teams on leadership. How do you be better leaders? And they charge phenomenal rates for it. And he came to me and said, look, we have 100 PhDs in psychology. Would you join us as the business person and help us scale the business? And I said, look, I'm a finance guy. I don't think I'm going to really fit in well with 100 psychologists, to be perfectly honest with you. Um, but nevertheless, I went over there and started to talk to him. And I said, well, you know, walk me through a business case on how you've done. And they said, look, we help Chevron Chemical go from a billion dollar a year loss to $500 million a year profit in 18 months. And I can give you the CEO of that business unit, who's now the CEO, was then the CEO of Chevron. And he will tell you that without learning what we taught him, he would have never done it. And I said, well, as a finance guy, billion and a half dollars in 18 months is pretty impressive. <laughs> you have my attention. And I went through case after case. And what they told me was this, look, performance of every organization, your financial statements are the sum of the behaviors of the people in your organization. And you can link those two together it is behavior, and if you can understand behavior, and applied behavioral science will help you understand behavior, you can improve bottom line financial performance by changing behavior, by shaping it, and by going through the change process faster. And culture is really the behaviors and the reinforcers on those behaviors, and you design culture to achieve your strategic objectives. Some people say, oh, we got a great culture, it's fun to be here, and I say, well, that's not all the culture is, and the only reason I want it to be fun to be here is so I can attract and retain the best people. That's my goal, right? And so what these behavioral analysts taught me was, first set up your strategic objectives. Who are you and what are you trying to accomplish? Then get really clear on what behaviors you need to accomplish that. Then put in the systems reinforcement, and that behavior and those systems reinforcement, what behavioralists call consequences, are what your culture is. So if you think about it, let me, simple example, can I do a quick example? If I take Apple and Pacific Gas and Electric, two multi-billion dollar companies out on the West Coast. In fact, they're about an hour from each other, right? They have very different strategic objectives. Apple is creative, they want new products, they take risk, right? Pacific Gas and Electric has one value on their website. That value is, what would you think? Safety. That's what they value above all else. Do you think they value risk taking? Do you think they value getting things wrong? Right, like Apple does. Doesn't mean, so they have a culture that reinforces the behaviors around safety. That's right for their strategic objectives. And you design your culture to achieve those goals, not the other way around. You design your culture to achieve those objectives. So as leaders, first understand what you're trying to achieve, then get really clear on what behaviors you need, and then use behavioral science to bring those behaviors to life, 
Behavioralists say they're called antecedents, they activate behaviors, but then more importantly, put in the right consequence systems to reinforce the behaviors you want. And consequence systems to negatively reinforce the behaviors you don't want. And you can have a sustainable culture. Culture is a hard science because behavior is a hard science, not and so Do you I, have any resources you can refer us to? So, yeah, so I would say two best books I've ever written on, read on this is one, Bringing Out the Best in People by a gentleman named Aubrey Daniels. And Aubrey is really kind of the father of the science in bringing applied behavioral science to business. And Aubrey was the one who initially said, look, this behavior stuff's wonderful, but the way to make money on it is to change outcomes in business. And if we can get leaders to change behavior in an organization in a way that drives bottom line financial performance, we can probably make a lot of money selling this, you know? And so he built a firm to do that. And then there's another book called The Behavior Breakthrough uh, by Steve Jacobs. And Steve is the chairman of CLG, that firm that I worked with. And they're kind of an offshoot of Aubrey's business. They're all, you know, it's a small community there. But those two books are phenomenal. And I'd always read Aubrey's first. It's really the basics of applied behavioral science, but he'll teach you. And I would also say, my wife would tell you that, thank God we read those books because we were better parents as a result. Because Shaping your children's behavior matters a lot, right? And there's just so much, he, I can't go through it all, there's so much he teaches you in the book that you can apply in every aspect of your life. Thank you for that. We have time for a few questions. Um, yes, sir. Um, I just wanted to uh, throw out a couple of marks that you didn't mention and understand why those aren't priorities in terms of what you're addressing. Uh, one is cyber threat analysis. The basic problem I think that you're posing is how do you allocate resources efficiently in relation to uh, opportunities. And cyber threat analysis is something that's on the front burner of many organizations. It's a question of how do you allocate resources in order to minimize the threat in relation to scenarios. The other possible target market is uh, population health. And there you have the same problem from an insurance standpoint, that is, with respect to population segments, how do you allocate health care resources and behavior to any other kind of support to uh, minimize costs, maximize health outcomes? Yeah, why don't we talk targets of opportunity in terms of those population segments, viewing those as similar to uh, you know, IT or COVID problems? Yeah, the question is, thank you, Neil. Um, has John or Decision Lens looked at other markets, including cyber threat analysis and population health? They also have similar um, issues and problems out there, and they're also huge markets. Have you looked at those? What do you think of them, et cetera? So, yeah, thank you, Neil, for the question. First of all, one of the challenges is that you can apply this solution to almost any portfolio challenge, right? So Dr. Saadi, who invented this, was hired by the apartheid to help them decide if they would let Nelson Mandela out of jail or not, right? Because it was a portfolio choice. If we let him out, here's a scenario. If we don't, here's a scenario. Poland hired him, should we be in the Euro or not? And so one of the challenges we have as small businesses, we have to pick a market and focus on it. Cyber tends to come underneath our IT portfolio within that realm, and cyber is something that we've begun to look at. Um, but it's one of the challenges, Neil, is that we can apply this to everything. And one of my challenges is to get the company to focus on something to be great at, or we're just gonna be good at a lot of different things and we're not going to scale. Um, I always joke with the founders that our target market before was anyone with a check. And um, we're really good at focusing on that. Uh, you know, but we've talked with, we, we talked with a very large foundation three or four weeks ago, one you've heard of, who wants to maybe use the technology to figure out how they should give out grants. And we've done a lot of grant work in the past. We've done facilities management. We've done, as I said, we've done things for transportation. We do lots of human capital work, not just within the sports venue, but within the federal government, we do a lot of human capital planning. But what I worry about as a small business person is I have a certain amount of resources and I have to allocate them. So I have to prioritize, and I really believe, and I maybe end up being wrong about this, I think we're gonna be much better off to be great at one thing than be good at 10. And so that's why, now, if, if somebody wants to use our technology to go build those businesses, I'm all in on that too. And we're actually talking with some people who have some ideas on portfolios. We say, look, we'll license it for that use case. You go build that use case. You have subject matter expertise, we don't have it. Go build that, you know? And we may do that on partnering, but for us as a company, I really wanna find one thing to be absolutely great at. Thanks, John. Another question, Bernadette? Exactly going to be my question. So your decision and drive 
private conversation, uh, making technology, platform technology. Uh, how do you change it to so so that the parameters reflect the strategic goals and cultures of the organization or the industry that you are applying? Can you just give me an idea of how the process of translating those values into mathematical algorithms works? Yeah. Okay. So the question is, how do we take the strategic objectives and bring those into mathematical algorithms? And so first of all, when we start with a use case, we work with the client to understand what their strategic objectives are. However, if we pick one use case to be great at, what we found is we can build blueprints where the strategic objectives are similar across organizations. You may want to edit them, but you don't need to start from scratch, right? And then there's a process within AHP called a pairwise, I won't go through it, where you end up weighting those objectives. And it's a really interesting way to come up with a weighting for each one of those objectives because they're not weighted equally. And I'd be happy to give you some more. I'm not going to bore everybody with all this, but I'd be happy to give you some more information on it later if you'd like, Bernadette. But it's called a pairwise process. And it is a matter of we've got to bring the available experts and data into a model to not only weight but rate those projects. And one of the things about being great at one thing is we can develop a model, which is a blueprint, so when we give it to somebody, it'll be their 80 to 90% solution, and they won't have to start from scratch on these things. When I go into a new use case, we have to start from scratch. What are your strategic objectives? How do we weight those? There's a lot of that upfront work that we want to get away from, and that's what we're doing. But the, the math, and I would share with some things with you on AHP, I think would help you better understand how do those things get Because one of the things Dr. Saadi does incredibly well is dealing with both um, what, what would I, how would I want to call this, you know, subjective measurements, you know, as well as objective measurements, you know, and so, and so, but I, got to, I would want to bore you with all those details right here. Yes. I think we have time for a couple more. Yes. What's the biggest mistake you've ever made? Oh, that's a long list. Um, yeah. <laughs> well said, well said. You know, there's, there's two that comes to mind. Probably the biggest mistakes I've ever made have been in hiring. When I didn't, I, you have a discipline process for doing it and then I shortcut it. And then I make a hiring mistake because hiring mistakes have such broad ramifications on the organization. And, and they're especially bad when you sit in this chair, you know, when you're the CEO because you hire someone who's gonna have this rippling effect across the organization, you know, and you can imagine that there's pictures that come to mind, and it's my fault, it's not their fault, right? I, I didn't do a good job in hiring, right? And so that's probably the biggest mistake, and, and I've made that more than once, you know? Um, and then the other one is, I think it goes back to something I mentioned earlier when I was in the paging business, um, and you know, we were just absolutely adamant that we were gonna have a market for a long time, and I wouldn't listen to the signs around me. You know, and we talked ourselves into, we drank our own Kool-Aid and talked ourselves into that. And I learned a lot about markets at that point. And I think I learned a lot about seeking advice and being more objective, you know. And um, that was, I think, a big mistake at the end of the day. So, but you learn. Thank you, Janice. Anyone else? Fred? Great Who question. are some of the people you seek advice from locally? Uh, Tien, <laughs> of course. Um, you know, I have, I have one advisor that I go to on a pretty regular basis, and he's actually one of the gentlemen who's helped me with this whole leadership and culture area. Um, because, like it or not, when you sit in the CEO chair, you don't necessarily have peers in the room, right? And so it makes it a little hard, and so I've got to have somebody who will keep me honest and be my conscience. And this person has done a lot to help myself, my team, he does a lot of work in culture and strategy. Uh, but more than anything, he's, you know, I'll walk him through something and he's willing to call me on it, you know? And he's willing to tell me when I'm just kidding myself and I'm not being honest with myself. And, you know, and so I talk to him fairly regularly about things I'm challenged with. Um, you know, and beyond that, it's just other CEOs in the marketplace and it depends on the issue, you know, because they'll have common problems. And I just try to stay active in the network and talk to them about what's going on in your business. You know, like right now I seek people who have the crossing the chasm problem because I can read the book and talk to consultants, but, you know, there's nothing life having actually crossed it, you know, and what were the pitfalls and what do you need to be worried about, et cetera. So, you know, I try to find people 
not just people that I respect, but people I respect that also maybe have like challenges in their business. Great. Well, John, on behalf of everybody in the room, we really thank you for your time this morning and hope you'll stick around later. Yeah. Um, thank you. So, thank you so much.